Hello, Professor Putnam here. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about climate change. Uh, increasing numbers of people do recognize global warming as a problem and one that is caused by human activity. Uh, but there are still a lot of skeptics out there, and it's good to be skeptical. I'm not opposed to that, but I do want to make sure that people understand uh, that uh, how to maybe counter some of the arguments of some of the skeptics of global warming, that the science really is uh, weighing in on one side of this issue. If you look at this graph, you can see, uh, or this timeline, uh, you can see that uh, atmospheric CO2, the black line, and average global temperature, the blue line, are shown here going back about 600 million years. Now this is a highly speculative graph produced by skeptics, but it still could potentially be accurate. It's just we can't know that for sure. But it shows carbon dioxide levels far, far higher, uh, orders of magnitude higher than how much uh, there is in the atmosphere today. And skeptics would say, well, see, the Earth, uh, it's normal for the Earth to have this kind of carbon dioxide, these kinds of carbon dioxide levels. Uh, and uh, that's an interesting argument and one that we should obviously uh, consider because it is likely that even if this isn't accurate, there are there were much higher concentrations of carbon dioxide. Uh, but there are a few things that kind of, uh, I, th I think, make this not really comparing apples to apples when you're looking at the Earth now and looking at the Earth at this time. So a couple of those might be, uh, first of all, most of the continents were smooshed together into a, a large supercontinent called Pangaea for much of this time, which is going to vastly change uh, everything about the Earth's, uh, you know, temperature and uh, sort of uh, si worldwide systems, like the thermohaline circulation, for example. Um, so how, so uh, that's one reason that this is kind of a totally different scenario. Uh, another example is the atmosphere. For example, Earth's early atmosphere was largely methane. Uh, uh, even at this time, oxygen levels were lower than they are today. Uh, and had just reached at some time around 500 million years ago, um, or maybe 600, uh, levels close to what they are today. Uh, also, you have things like the sun, uh, the, something called the faint sun paradox. The sun is actually getting brighter as we go through Earth's history, so that's changing. And then we have volcanic cycles, so as these continents are shifting around and forming Pangaea, you might have a lot more vol volcanoes emitting a lot more carbon dioxide. And that's all fair and uh, you know fair and good, but we have to remember that these circumstances were vastly different than things are today. And secondly, and very importantly, five times during this period there were catastrophic uh, mass extinction events, killing off usually more than half the species on the planet, sometimes up to eighty or ninety percent. Uh, so obviously, this was not a sort of mild period uh, where you know, where th there's nothing, you know, no warning signs here would exist that carbon dioxide levels might not be a problem. Uh, so throughout this period, we see mass extinction events. Uh, and the question may be asked, well, are we setting one in motion now with our triggering of carbon dioxide levels? So I think it's more beneficial to look at actually the Earth, since things were so vastly different then, uh, as it is in, in a more, uh, in a shorter time scale. So if we look at this next graph, we can see the cycles that have taken place over about the last almost a million years, uh, starting on the left side uh, at the present and kind of going backwards. And you can see on the bottom carbon dioxide levels in blue. In the middle, you see uh, it, it's actually uh, an, what isotope of oxygen exists, which gives a fairly good approximation of temperature fluctuations. So there's certain isotopes will exist more often when it's warmer and less often when it's cooler. Uh, and so when you see more of those isotopes, you'll think, oh, this must be a hotter period in Earth's history. So uh, this, these isotopes of oxygen act, act as a proxy for temperature. And then you also see methane levels uh, fluctuating as well. And you can see there is substantial uh, sort of harmony between these two graphs. These things seem to go uh, together. Now, you might ask justifiably, well, how do we know? How do we know? What do you? How do you know what the earth, the air was like on Earth this long ago? Well, interestingly, we can actually measure that directly. This is not as speculative as the first graph. In this graph, we can directly measure. Uh, excuse me. So we can directly measure the air itself from hundreds of thousands of years ago because it hasn't been trapped in that ice, just like bubbles of air get trapped in your ice cube tray, as snow is accumulated in Antarctica. Uh, it's been compressed, 
and then the air has been trapped inside the ice. And when we take an ice core, we can actually pull that ice out, open up those bubbles, and see what's in the air. And we can measure then the levels of carbon dioxide, uh, the types of isotopes of oxygen, which, as, as I said, act as a proxy for global temperature, and then also see levels of methane and, and other uh, components as well. So by seeing that, we see these very uh, even cycles that have, uh, that have um, taken place throughout the last few hundred thousand years. And they sort of correspond to glaciation cycles, uh, you know, where the Earth might be more glaciated uh, than at, at different times in the past, like the last ice age of 10 to 15,000 years ago. Uh, and those actually correspond somewhat to something called Milankovitch cycles, uh, which are sort of complicated uh, things about uh, the, the way the Earth spins uh, on its axis. Uh, but uh, you can also see there's a correlation between carbon dioxide levels and uh, that global temperature. Now, the shocking thing is that, as you can see, carbon dioxide levels fluctuate between about 200 parts per million ppm and about 300 parts per million but we are currently, the air you are breathing right now actually has about 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide. So you can see we've gone, you know, about 30, 40% above what we've ever seen in recent history with sort of the Earth uh, in its sort of present form, the way it functions now. So we've uh, vastly changed this cycle. Methane itself has gone up to about 2,000 parts per billion, uh, which you can see it never went above 800 that we can detect in the last million or so years. So we can only predict or guess that since these things seem to be correlated in history, that the temperature then is going to rise as a result. And that's what we've seen. We've seen the temperature slowly rising and we might expect it to be much more sudden. It might take a while actually for temperature to catch up uh, with what's been done as far as CO2 and methane, but it seems logical to, to say that it would catch up. So the important thing is when we look at more recent history, we can see that with the Earth having sort of the same geology, biology, the same atmosphere as it has uh, for the last few million years, uh, there are certain cycles uh, in which we no longer exist. <laughs> or in other words, we've pushed things outside the bounds of what those cycles, it seems, uh, have naturally encompassed. Uh, and because of that, we have every reason to expect uh, well, on one hand, that anything could happen, but also every reason to expect that global temperatures are going to rise substantially and we're going to maybe enter some sort of new phase. And uh, looking at more uh, longer term history as we did before, knowing that the, those mass extinctions have existed uh, in the past, uh, it's, it's frightening, frightening to consider what those changes in carbon dioxide levels could ultimately do as far as uh, life on Earth uh, uh, surviving uh, sort of in the, uh, the with the relationships and ecosystems that currently that we currently uh, live with